It's time for question period. I turn to the, the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you and uh, good morning, uh, Speaker. My question is to the uh, if they let me, uh, Speaker, if they let me, my question will be to the Acting oh, Premier. Speaker, call them in order. Thank you, uh, Speaker, uh, to the Acting Premier. Keith Curry, the uh, President of Ontario Federation of Agriculture, said, quote, much of rural Ontario is actually feeling very abandoned, quote. Mr. Speaker, why has this government abandoned rural Ontario? Minister of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. Mr. Agriculture and Municipal Affairs. Well, thanks uh, very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate the um, question from the Leader of the Opposition this morning. I want to congratulate him on assuming his uh, new position uh, here in the House. But let me, um, let me respond from this perspective. When you look at agriculture today in the province of Ontario, it is the leading economic driver. $37.5 billion to Ontario's GDP. 800,000 Ontarians are employed in this sector each and every day. And the foundation of all this is 50,000 family farms in the province of Ontario. Wow. If you just take a moment to tour the back concessions and sit at the kitchen tables, we are seeing unprecedented expansion in dairy, in chicken, Order. in eggs. In fact, I have a letter sitting on, on my desk from Mark, Mark Brock, the former head of the Green Farmers of Ontario, thanking for our leadership in initiating a national review of business risk programs for, for farmers in Ontario. I return to the Leader of the Majesty's yeah. Opposition. Thank you. Uh, back to the Acting Premier. The Ontario Federation of Agriculture added that rural Ontario needs, quote, infrastructure investments like widespread broadband and access to affordable energy, especially natural gas. Rural Ontario needs, quote, increased social infrastructure, including local schools and medical care centres that will attract new businesses. It will increase new jobs and will, it will attract new residents. But this Ontario government has turned their back again on rural Ontario. In fact, rural Ontario has been abandoned by this Liberal government. Madam Speaker, that must change. Will the budget increase support for rural Ontario? I recognize the Minister of Agriculture and Foods. Well, Mr. Madam Speaker, it's a little rich uh, coming from this party. Every time that we have major initiatives for infrastructure in any of our budgets, over the last 15 years that I've had the great privilege of representing the people from Peterborough Riding, these folks over here voted against it. So let's, let's have a little history here. 1998-1999, there was a famous uh, commission that they put in place called the Who Does What Commission. And I remember it very well. I remember it extremely well. But most people in municipal government renamed that commission to the Who Got Done In Commission. And who got done in? municipalities right across the province of Ontario. I remind these folks over there, 43% of all the roads and bridges were downloaded in eastern Ontario. And I must say, this government is digging out of that ditch that they left with their... Return to the Leader of the Majesty Opposition. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and back to the Acting Premier. How many have you taken back? You know the rules. This is not your playground. Okay, if the next time I stand up again, there will be interruptions, someone will be named. Okay, and Ward. Okay, I return to the Leader of Majesty Opposition. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, Bob Gordonier, the president of the Beef Farmers of Ontario and a current Liberal candidate, says, quote, Our number one ask with the Ontario Agricultural Sustainability Coalition is to raise the cap for risk management program. S Speaker, he added, quote, our message to the government has been clear. The $100 million cap has compromised the stability, predictability, and timeliness the program provides. It's, quote, making it less effective and less responsive. Ontario must act to support rural Ontario. Madam Speaker, will the, will, the will the acting premier commit 
to raising the risk management program cap. This returns to the Minister of Agriculture and Food and Rural Affairs. Madam Speaker, I've tried to be as calm as I can here. So it's rather interesting. When we proposed a $100 million risk management program, they voted against it. When, they, when, when their federal cousins were in Ottawa, they did not lift one hand for the federal government at that time to match the Ontario Initiative at 60 per cent. They were nowhere to be found. And frankly, we're doing a review of RMP in the province of Ontario. Uh, that is going to make a more effective program for the non-supply uh, command uh, groups here in Ontario. And in fact, it was Ontario's leadership alone that has brought about a national review a business risk management program applauded by the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, applauded by the Christian Farmers of Ontario, applauded by the National Farmers Union, and applauded on every farmer in the back concessions of Ontario. Yeah. I, I recognize the member Member for Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister of the Status of Women. Today marks the first ever Human Trafficking Awareness Day in Ontario. As you know, this is an issue that I care deeply about. Over the past several years, I've traveled across this province, meeting with survivors, victim services organizations, police officers, and many others to encourage cooperation and to raise awareness about this horrible crime that targets our children, mostly young girls, who on average age are 14 years old and 93 per cent are Canadian-born. One of the reactions I keep getting when speaking with parents, grandparents and young people is absolute shock at these statistics and the fact that this crime is happening right in our neighbourhoods, whether it's in big cities or small towns, from Kenora to Timmins or from Ottawa to Windsor. So on this Human Trafficking Awareness Day, will the government to commit to funding comprehensive province-wide awareness campaign to educate Ontarians about how to recognize and fight human sex trafficking? Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the, the member opposite for the question. Human trafficking is a devastating crime that violates human rights, and I want you to know that we are working very hard to help survivors receive the supports they need and to put an end to it. Last year, we launched Ontario's strategy to end human trafficking and made an investment of close to $72 million. As a part of our human trafficking strategy, we passed the Anti-Human Trafficking Act 2017. This Act allows for survivors to apply for restraining orders against human traffickers to protect themselves or their children from traffickers. It will make it easier for survivors of human trafficking to gain compensation from those who traffic them in order to restore and rebuild their lives. And of course, it, it proclaims February 22nd as Human Trafficking Day. I return back to questions. The member from Kawasa Lake. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, again, to the minister, um, thank you for absorbing parts of the bill that we've been fighting for on this side for over two years, saving the girl next door. Thank you, but Ontario is known to be a major hub for human sex trafficking in North America. And yet other jurisdictions, whether it's Manitoba or New York, are way ahead of us when it comes to public awareness initiatives. In those jurisdictions, you can't go through an airport or go to a hotel without seeing a poster informing the public about human sex trafficking and educating passerbys about how to spot potential victims. Why is this government that they cannot find the money to fund advertising that can raise an awareness campaign that could actually help save the lives of human sex trafficking today instead of finding money to fund self-serving hydro ads. So, Mr. Speaker, will the government today commit to an awareness campaign that can actually help save the lives of human sex trafficking? 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it is unacceptable that people in our society are at the risk of being trafficked. And I want you to know that uh, across government, we take this issue very seriously. Here's what we've done so far. We have our Human Trafficking Lived Experiences Roundtable, which will strengthen the province's efforts to end human trafficking through direct engagement input from survivors of trafficking. We have enhanced funding by 6.65 uh, to 47 community a million to 47 community-based service partners delivering the victim crisis assistance program and expanded the victim uh, victim witness assistance program by 767,000 to hire new specialized human trafficking victim service workers we we've expanded the victim quick response program by 1.93 million dollars to allow victims of human trafficking to access new benefits and we're hiring for the new provincial human trafficking yes, prosecution team I return team. back to the member for Halliburton Carwathalik as an uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, Minister, this is a real crisis happening to real people, happening to our children. So what can be more important than educating the public and our children about this horrible crime of exploitation? The reality is that every elementary school, every high school in Ontario is a target for traffickers. Yeah. Elementary school principals in my writing have told me that children are regularly getting text messages luring them into modelling. What 12 or 14 year old wouldn't be tempted to have such an extremely attractive offer? Shameful. The fact is they can fall into the trap of trafficking in as little as 24 hours. Education about human sex trafficking needs to be in our schools. Madam Speaker, why has the government chosen to ignore the urgent need to educate our kids about human sex trafficking like other jurisdictions do? Here, here. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, we had the opportunity to go right across the province to talk to leaders, to advocates about best positioning children, young, young youth and children here in the province exactly. to prevent sex trafficking. We brought forward a very comprehensive piece of legislation, Bill 89. And Bill 89 does something that speaks to exactly what that member is talking about. It, it raises the age of protection for child protection. But we know that the Conservative Party here in the province voted against it. Wow. We know that the member from Carleton, Mississippi Mills told the Ottawa Community News that there was a caucus meeting where members from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, Kitchener, Conestoga, Chatham, Kent, Essex, and Niagara West uh, Glam uh, Glambrook insisted that they need to vote against Bill 89 because the Life Coalition told them to do that. You should do what's in the best interest of children and stand up for the children and families in this province. Mr. Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'd like to start by uh, sharing New Democrats' concerns with the people of Brantford who are dealing with the serious flooding, as well as the family and community members in Orangeville who are dealing with the tragedy that's unfolding with a missing three-year-old young boy. Uh, Speaker, my question is for the Premier, or uh, Acting Premier, I guess. Uh, Kristen and David Ronald are a Hamilton couple, and right now they're spending their sixth day stuck in Costa Rica. The Ronalds were on vacation last week when David had a very serious fall. He went to an emergency uh, surgery on Friday and was ready to be transferred home to Hamilton on Saturday for further surgeries, but he was told that there were no hospital beds available for him. David had to have his second surgery as a result in Costa Rica. He and Kristen are finally able to come home today. What is the Liberal government's excuse for why this couple spent six days in a foreign country waiting for a hospital bed to open up at home? Of health and long-term care. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to express my uh, deepest concern uh, for the Ronald family as they go through this difficult uh, crisis uh, and experience. It's stressful uh, any time a loved one is injured or requires surgery, whether that be here or uh, abroad. Uh, Madam Speaker, I know that there's nothing uh, more important to all of us than the health and safety of our loved ones. And when it comes to a situation like this, the hospital. The insurance company and all of us can do better in coordinating that care. 
My staff have confirmed that an average of 10 intensive care unit beds were available throughout the Hamilton Niagara Lynn this past weekend, and more than 140 intensive care beds available uh, across the province. However, we cannot verify whether the insurer contacted all hospitals in the region, Mr. S Madam Speaker. What is important, however, now is that we make the full service of Ontario's health care system completely available to this family. But I need to mention that the Lynn was not contacted, Madam Speaker. My ministry was not contacted with regards to this case, mm -hmm. and my office was not contacted uh, with regards to this case. Thank you. I return to the leader of the third party. Thank Thank you, Speaker. I think it's pretty sad when the Minister of Health blames an insurance company for the failures of his government and his ministry. The Ronalds are scared, Speaker. David is lucky to be alive right now. They have been through a lot this past week, and the whole time, all they wanted was to come home. David is in stable condition now, but he and Kristen have been through an or ordeal that no Ontario family should have to face. Is this crisis finally clear to the government? Do they finally understand the real-life effects that years and years of budget cuts and freezes have had at our hospitals? Hospitals and that have on people like David and Kristen. Uh, Madam, Madam Speaker, when it comes to a situation like this, as I mentioned, the hospital, the insurance company, all of us can do better in coordinating that care. And that includes the NDP, yeah. Madam Speaker, who are once again putting politics over patients. Yesterday, as soon as my office heard about the situation from the media, uh, Mr. Madam Speaker, we were on the phone working with the Lynn and local hospitals to find a bed. This was all triggered by the Hamilton Spectator asking, following a media release by the third party. Until that point, the ministry and the Lynn were unaware of the situation. The leader of the NDP had the opportunity to plan an event, to, to, to pull out a question period and make a statement in Hamilton, all before she could notify us and ask for help and allow us to help. Four after her press conference, my office finally received an email from her asking what we could do to assist this family. The Hamilton Health Sciences received a similar contact even later in the day from the member opposite, Mr. Yes, Madam Speaker. My, as I mentioned, my staff confirmed that over 140 ICU beds were open across this province, including 10 in that list. Thank you. Thank you. Return to the leader of the third party. Madam Speaker, I have to say I am shocked that the Minister of Health thinks that I, the leader of the third party needs to do his job for him. That is ridiculous, Speaker. That is ridiculous. The it's never too early to warn somebody. I return to the leader of the third party. Speaker, this minister acknowledges that his ministry has a lack of coordination with their Lynn. I got a desperate call, a desperate call from constituents in my riding, and I proudly did my job and went to bat for them. And you know what? This overcrowding crisis is not just about this particular uh, uh, situation. There are problems rife in our system. Danny Marchand is a Londoner, and he was badly injured in a downhill skiing accident in Collingwood this month. He spent 11 days waiting in the hospital in Collingwood before a bed opened up in London so that he could be transferred home. 11 days in pain. The question is, why have Okay. I recognize the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Madam Speaker. What I find remarkable is she is the local MPP. But instead of contacting my ministry or, the, or my office. I'm going to start warning people. Minister Souza, first time.
Okay, I recognize the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. A party that closed 9,645 hospital beds, a party that closed 24 per cent of all the acute beds in this province, is not going to give me lessons on how to place a patient in this province, Mr. Madam Speaker. We are now working as hard as humanly possible to ensure that this family is able to avail themselves of the health services. No thanks to that third party, Madam Speaker. recognize the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. I'm glad the Minister of Health again acknowledged the Liberal that was at the helm back in those days. Uh, Speaker, my next question is for the Acting Premier. Yesterday, the MPP for Nickel Belt uh, told this House about Leo, an elderly man in Sudbury who spent 13 days receiving his medical care in a bathroom at Health Sciences North. His pillow was beside a toilet. Speaker, The Premier and her Liberal government had have, have had nearly 15 years to fix the problem problems in our hospitals, and instead they have made them worse. Why is this Liberal government ignoring the crisis that they've helped create in our hospital system? Acting Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Madam Speaker, we know that uh, many of our hospitals have had uh, capacity challenges uh, over the uh, last number of months. And Madam Speaker, we have worked hard to make sure that they have the resources that they require to continue to provide that highest quality of care. And every single outcome that we're measuring in terms of health comes for patients is either sustained or is improved over the past years uh, under this government, Madam Speaker. In the case of Health Sciences North, we increased their budget by $6 million last year. We provided them with more than a dozen additional acute care beds last fall, which was part of 1,200, the equivalent of six community hospitals, 1,200 new acute care beds that were provided right across this province at an investment of $100 million. We've just recently renewed that investment, almost doubling it, Madam Speaker, into the ne next fiscal year to ensure that those capacity challenges are are adequately addressed. I return back to the leader of their party. Only an out-of-touch Liberal can call somebody having their pillow beside a toilet an improvement in our hospital system. The last Conservative government fired 6,000 nurses and they closed 28 hospitals. This Liberal government has had 15 years, Speaker, 15 years to fix the problems. But instead, they have followed down the same path with more hospital cuts and budget freezes. Now, conveniently, right before an election, they're saying that they've been investing in hospitals all along. This is what makes people extremely cynical about politics, Speaker. Why are the Liberals more concerned about their own electoral chances in this upcoming election than they are about the well-being of Ontarians? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, that party removed 230 drugs from the formulary when they were in power. They closed 24 per cent of the acute care beds in this province. They closed 13 per cent of the mental health beds in the province. 9,645 beds they closed altogether. They delisted home care, Madam Speaker. In their last budget, they reduced hospital funding by 1 per cent. I know the leader of the third party would love to blame this on someone who was an NDP with a cabinet, with a full government, suggesting that that leader now is a liberal, uh, a, a liberal Madam Speaker. If that's the best she can do to defend their record in the 1990s, I think it's extraordinary. But, Madam Speaker, when we look at every single outcome, which is important to Ontarians, we know over the past uh, decade plus that those outcomes have improved, and that's what's important to Ontarians. Well, the truth hurts, Speaker. The truth hurts. <laughs> Kristen and David Ronald, Leo, Danny Marchand, and all of the patients and families, all of the other patients and families who have shared how the hospital overcrowding and hallway medicine crisis has affected their lives, they deserve better. They deserve better than a government that cuts the services that we all count on. When will this Premier and her Liberal government wake up? to the fact that people can see through their political tricks and finally understand that hospital overcrowding is a matter of life and death. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Madam Speaker, that's why we invested 
half a billion dollars in our hospitals last year, That's half right. a billion dollars the previous year, Madam Speaker. And when we look at outcomes, mortality rates, cancer outcomes, avoidable deaths from health outcomes compared to all other provinces, compared to other developed countries, Ontario outperforms all other provinces and is close to the top of the OECD. The rate of potential years of life lost has improved by 18 per cent between 2003 and 2013. We have the lowest rate of potential years of life lost in the entire country. We have the best five-year survival rates for prostate, breast, colorectal uh, uh, lung cancers in Canada, Madam Speaker, and our mortality rate is among the best in the world. We have the second best survival rate for breast cancer in the OECD, and the list goes on and on. We have the shortest wait times across the board of any province or territory in this country, Madam here, here. Speaker. We are the only one of two provinces, we're the only one of only two in to actually improve our wait times from 2016 to 2017. We have the shortest wait time from GP to specialist, shortest wait times from specialist to treatment, shortest wait times for CT scans, MRIs, Answer. ultrasounds, radiation oncology, general surgery, gynecological Thank procedures, Thank and the list. Thank you. I recognize the member. I recognize the member from Elgin Middlesex London. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. And, and Madam Speaker, the, the issue with Mr. Ronald and Hamilton isn't a one-off. Uh, two weeks ago, I dealt with a Mr. Claire Seeley from London, who was stuck in the Dominican Republic bleeding internally. The country had run out of blood, yet he wasn't allowed to return to Ontario for treatment. He was stuck because of a catchment issue. It took my office two days of intervening to find a bed space for this man. But it was, it was in fact, this government's policy at restricting patients to their catchment area of Ontario that restricted him to receiving the care in this province. Shame. It was government policy that was interfering with this man returning home, Mr. S Madam Speaker. And in fact, that this patients had to call their MPP or the ministry to actually get health care is wrong in this province. We have a health care system that should be responsive to the people where they live and not have to defend or go to the fact to the politicians. Madam Speaker, I asked the minister this. He has risked the lives through his policy of Ontarians who have to seek emergency medical treatment return to Ontario. Does he think the ministry Health has the correct policy in place today. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for giving me the opportunity to explain what the policy is. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, there is uh, no uh, restriction uh, with regards to any Ontarian here or abroad if they're a resident of this province, if they have uh, health insurance, uh, Madam Speaker. There is absolutely no restriction to any access to health services anywhere in the province, and to do otherwise is illegal. So the policy is very, very clear. But, but, Madam Speaker, it is important that when a patient is out of country, first of all, it's critically important that they have travel insurance, yeah. but when an emergency does take place, what is required of the insurance company is they contact a doctor here in this province, and that doctor then works to provide the plan of care for that specific patient. It's critically important. And often, Mr. Madam Speaker, and I can say with experience that that connection either isn't made or it's not strong enough, and it's critically important that that insurer you? take on the responsibility that they have and the local doctor as well harness the resources to provide that, that care. I return back to the member Thank you, Madam Speaker. Speaker. Uh, perhaps the uh, minister needs to look at his policies of the Ministry of Health, and in fact they are limited to catchment areas. Uh, Madam Speaker, you look no further the fact that the government has created this problem because they froze hospital budgets, they've cut nursing positions, and in fact what they've done is overburdened our health care system. Sure. This government refused to take meaningful action, which has not only overcrowded our health care system, but has strained resources, leading to violence in our health care system. And, Madam Speaker, I think we can speak to all the RNs that are here today. Sometime during their job over the last few years, they've experienced an increase in violence at their workplace. My question to the minister. You failed, in fact, in delivering health care to those Ontarians traveling abroad. Now you're failing in providing a safe work environment for our RNs. Will the minister commit to providing a safe working environment for the RNs throughout our province? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Madam Speaker, of course 
I will. In fact, we have set up a table which is, which is jointly chaired by the Minister of Labour and myself that contains experts, associations, frontline health care workers that is working specifically on this issue to reduce and eradicate violence against all health care workers across the health care system. But, Madam Speaker, I find it extraordinary that the member opposite is talking about nurses at all when, when they were in power. In fact, even just between 1995 and 1998, in three short years, they fired 6,279 nurses, apart from closing 10,000 hospital beds. Since we came in to government in 2003, more than 30,000 more nurses have begun work in this province. That's an increase of 27 per cent. In fact, the number of nurses employed in nursing in Ontario has now increased for the 13th year. There are 1,200 more nurses employed in this province Here, compared to just you. last year. I recognize the member from Windsor West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. In December, this Liberal government made a secretive backdoor decision to cut the amount of emergency leave days available to automotive workers under the Employment Standards Act. Since then, I have had countless conversations with my constituents who are outraged that the Liberal government would single them out in this way. I now have almost 1,500 signatures on a petition from workers and their families opposed to this cutback, and that's in addition to the thousands of signatures collected by Unifor. Auto workers are hardworking people, balancing physically strenuous jobs with the demands of raising a family. They deserve the same rights and protections as every other worker in Ontario. Absolutely. Will the Premier listen to these 1,500 Ontarians and countless others and immediately remove this unfair regulation? Uh, the Minister of uh, Labour, Speaker. Minister of Labour. Speaker, thank you, and thank you to the honourable member for the question. Speaker, Speaker, we've consulted with industry, we've consulted with stakeholders, we've consulted with labour. We put in place a personal emergency leave project, Speaker, in the auto sector specifically. What it required was that auto sector's employers, with more than 50 employees, provide each employee up to seven personal emergency leave days, as well as unlimited time off speaker for the death of a family member and that's on each occasion on the passing of a loved one speaker it was a specific recommendation of the advisors from the changing workplaces review so what happened on january the first of this year speaker all Ontarians now are covered for personal emergency leave and for sick time in the province of Ontario. Prior to that, Speaker, it only applied to companies greater than 50. Speaker, I'll expand on it in the Please supplementary. Recognize the member from Windsor West. Thank you. Back to the acting premier. 1,500 signatures collected in a week by from my constituents. Tens of thousands of more across the province. You clearly didn't didn't consult with those auto workers. The Cavalier responses we keep getting on this issue from this Liberal government shows just how out of touch they really are. When we asked about this regulation back in December, we were told that emergency and bereavement leave for auto workers is a regulatory burden that is getting in the way of businesses. Seriously? When challenged at a town hall in Windsor last week, the Premier said this was about fair workplaces and told workers not to worry because the vast majority of auto workers are unionized but mr speaker or madam speaker she knows that is not always the case it's not just workers that assemble vehicles that are impacted i've had calls from my constituents who work at paint plastic and parts suppliers who don't have the same benefits as workers at the assembly plants and they now have even less protection under the esa so I ask again, will the Premier truly commit to fair workplaces and immediately remove this unfair regulation? Thank you, Speaker. Let me reiterate, Speaker, and thank you to the member for this question. We're paying as much attention to this as we possibly can, and we get the same, we get the same input as the third party gets, Speaker. What we did on January 1st, for the first time in the history of the province of Ontario, Speaker, all employers in the auto sector are required to make personal emergency leave available to every employee that works in that sector. That wasn't the case before, Speaker. Companies under 50 were excluded from this. Speaker, this has a pilot project status. The advisor 
asked us to put it in place to see how it worked to get concert, to uh, to get feedback through consultation speaker it's still in a pilot project phase we're we're corresponding with the same folks at the third party as speaker we're determined to make this fair we're determined to keep ontario's auto sector competitive speaker so if i can close and just say as the labor reforms roll out we're going to continue the dialogue with the stakeholders, with the employers, with the employees in this regard, Speaker, to make sure we come to the right resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Member from uh, Guelph. Thank you very much, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Last year, our government passed the Anti-Human Trafficking Act, which proclaimed February 22nd as Human Trafficking Awareness Day. So, as you've heard, that means today is Ontario's first ever Human Trafficking Awareness Day, a day to better educate members of the public about human trafficking and ensure that people who require services and supports know how to access them. Sadly, Speaker, we know that our province is a major centre for human trafficking, with approximately 65 per cent of all cases across Canada taking place in Ontario. Our government and organizations across the province, like Guelph Wellington Women in Crisis, work tirelessly to educate our communities and support survivors of human trafficking. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House more about Human Trafficking Awareness Day? Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and to the member from Guelph for the question and her ongoing advocacy with respect to this issue. Our government is committed to protecting and supporting survivors of human trafficking, and we're working hard to prevent this heinous crime in the future. Today, on Ontario's first ever Human Trafficking Awareness Day, we're proud to launch our official Human Trafficking Awareness Campaign. Raising awareness is of the utmost importance, as human trafficking is a crime that is often hidden and vastly underreported. It is crucial for everybody, especially young people, to learn what human trafficking is and know what services and supports are available. So today we are excited to announce Ontario's new dedicated confidential human trafficking helpline. This helpline will allow people to get information about local human trafficking supports and services available across Ontario. Together with our community partners, we're using the hashtag NoHumanTrafficking to raise awareness of specific signs, risk factors, and facts about human trafficking. Thank you. Thank you. I'll return to the member from Guelph. Yes, thank you, uh, Minister. It's remarkable how far we've come in our effort to end human trafficking. Speaker, since our investment of $72 million through the anti-human trafficking strategy and our recent funding of $19 million to agencies across the province, a woman seeking supportive services has more options than ever before. When a girl from Kenora, Toronto or Windsor is looking for counselling services, therapy or a place to stay, we have taken action. When a woman needs help getting herself out of the vicious cycle of human trafficking, she can rely on the Victim Crisis Assistance Program. Survivors now have immediate access to tattoo removal, replacement of government documents, and recovery in a trauma-informed facility through the Victim Quick Response Program. The Attorney General has created a new provincial human trafficking Question. prosecution team with specialized grounds. But there's more to do. Can the Minister of the Status of Women please tell us more about the government's long-term strategy to prevent and address human trafficking? Mr. Committee of Social Services. To the Minister of the Status of Women. Mr. Status of Women. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to rise today as the Minister responsible for the status of women to recognize February 22nd as, as Annual Human Trafficking Awareness Day. Today is, one day is a day to speak up and raise awareness of the exploitation faced by young women and girls in Ontario today and every day. And it's also a day to recognize what's at stake for women and girls in this province because we must continue to fight the fight against human trafficking. We must bring human traffickers to justice, and that requires a long-term strategy and action, action that this government is wholeheartedly committed to today and in the future. 
We cannot list, uh, risk losing these justice sector initiatives. We cannot risk improving survivors' access to community services and supports. We cannot risk, Madam Speaker, what we cannot risk, Madam Speaker, is billions of dollars in cuts. Our government has accomplished so much in two years, and it's making yes, a difference in the lives of women and girls in communities throughout Ontario. We must continue to pour our hard work and effort into ensuring that everyone can live safely in this province. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. The member from Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Recently, a W-5 documentary aired, which expanded upon what I and many others already knew about the present state of the opioid crisis in Sault Ste. Marie. Statistics reveal that there are five overdoses per day within my community. In many circumstances, the concentration of the opioid, opioids within the street drugs being ingested are unknown. The crisis has already claimed the lives of way too many people, and with inadequate resources to address the current demand for services, the problem is getting much, much worse. Madam Speaker, this crisis cannot be ignored. Sault Ste. Marie needs financial support to help us prevent and treat those suffering from addiction from the inherent risks of opioid use. My question is, will this government please provide us with the financial support that we desperately need so that we can at least have a chance at preventing the further loss of life within my community? Minister of Health and Long -term Care. Well, Madam Speaker, I, I genuinely appreciate the question from the member opposite uh, representing uh, the Sioux area. Uh, and uh, as we both know, I think we all know this uh, opioid crisis uh, in Canada uh, in North America, in many parts of the world, uh, has uh, truly um, uh, shocked all of us uh, with regards to uh, its gravity and the innocent, vulnerable lives lost, including in Sault Ste. Marie and the surrounding region. Uh, we've invested uh, over a three-year period more than $200 million at every level and every aspect of this crisis so that we can uh, reduce those needless and preventable deaths and eventually uh, provide the necessary supports for all those who are faced with Sir? opioid uh, addiction. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm happy to speak in the supplementary in more detail with, resp with respect to this specific issue. Yeah, we turn to the member from Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of Finance. The frequency and impact of addictions is much more acute in Algoma than it is anywhere else. No, no, no. no, no. The rules, you have to return back to the Minister of Health with the question. Frequency and impact of addictions in the north is much more in Algoma is much more acute than anywhere else in the north. Inadequate resources have caused this burden to shift to our emergency department. For every 100 patients, 59.4 are opiate related, and 41.9 result in hospitalization. 12.2 result in death. Without help, these numbers are expected to grow by 58 percent within the next three years. Prior to the documentary, I had the opportunity to discuss a solution to this problem with the CAO of our local hospital. And a solution would be to bring all services under one roof within the community and provincial uh, to create a level three regional withdrawal management services building. The total cost of this project would be $11 million. My question, Madam Speaker, is will the minister find this money within the government's 2018 budget so that Sault Ste. Marie can have a chance at preventing the escalation of the crisis that is causing the lives of many people within my community. Thank you. Thank you. I return to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, Madam, Madam Speaker, I'm happy. Uh, I will, once uh, any proposal is received, I'm happy to review it and give it um, the most serious consideration. We are uh, expanding uh, services across the province. In uh, Sault Ste. Marie, for example, uh, $200,000 for the Sioux Hospital to create a RAM clinic, rapid access uh, clinic, uh, in the Algoma subregion, and it's a clinic that actually is going to serve as a hub uh, providing supports uh, via the Ontario Telemedicine Network to the uh, subregion communities. $130,000 for Sioux Area Hospital to modernize withdrawal management programs to provide 24-hour support and a pathway to the RAM. $245,000 to North Bay Regional Health Centre to create a RAM clinic in Nipissing to Miskaming subregion, and it's a clinic that will serve as a virtual hub to provide supports again to the surrounding communities. Uh, $85,000 to North Bay. Uh, for uh, to North Bay Recovery Home to modernize withdrawal management programs in the five, five subregions. More than $400,000 to South Cochrane Addiction Services to create a RAM clinic in the Cochrane subregion, and $400,000 to Health Sciences North to enhance their RAM clinic. Madam Speaker, these are some of the investments that are so badly needed. That investments that we are making, part of that $222 million, which is the largest spend in this province's history by far, specifically to reduce the impact of the crisis and eventually prevent any of those needless deaths. Thank you. Thank you. 
I recognize the member from Algoma, Manitoulin Island. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. This morning, I invited Annie Scott and her family to Queen's Park to present the concerns of 40 property owners in Scriber. These residents have, been see have seen the MPAC assessments skyrocket by an average of 250 per cent with no explanations, to compare to the provincial average increase of only 20 per cent. Mrs. Scott's house has been assessed at almost $100,000 more than another nearby house twice its size. She, sh she says she can no longer afford to live in her home, but no one will buy her home because of the high taxes. Does the minister understand that the MPAC assessment process is flawed, and will he commit to changing that process? Um, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate the question from the member in representing Annie Scott and Keith Scott, her, her son, as well as their daughter. And I appreciate and recognize the concerns they have. Um, we have a property on Walker's Lake in Schreiber uh, assessed by MPAC as was proposed through the Provincial Land Act so that we can provide fair assessments, recognizing that it's done in association with the municipalities uh, and, uh, and AMO, who are also on the MPAC board. But more importantly, this family and their neighbors are assessed in comparison to some of the values of sales that have happened in their respective area. But when you look at the unincorporated areas and elsewhere within the region, they are higher valued. And they have a right to be concerned in terms of what is taking place. And we are working with them. I know they have met with MPAC and some of the officials to try to find resolution. I know there's an appeal process which wasn't initiated by them at the time, but it's still available to them to try to foster reductions. And I'll answer more in regards to my discussions with the municipality in this regard. Thank you. Thank you. Return to the member from Algoma Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Minister. In 2016, farm assessments on Manitoulin Island double with no explanation. I can promise you that the income from these farms did not double, Mr. Spe uh, Mr. Minister. As speculators play havoc with Ontario's real estate market, MPAC assessments have become more arbitrary, inconsistent and unfair. And as the Auditor General revealed in her most recent report, property owners can't count on the Assessment Review Board to treat them fairly. Families like the Scots have asked the Premier for help, but she has done nothing. When will the Premier fix the MPAC assessment process? So again, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, the, uh, the issue is one that needs to be resolved in respect to this specific issue with the specific families and their neighbours in that respective area. Uh, as noted, the municipality has been engaged. I have met with them in regards to this. I know our officials have had uh, numerous discussions with Schreiber and with uh, some of the members who recognize that in order for us to alleviate some of their uh, concerns, there is mitigation that's available by Schreiber themselves and the municipality who has control over the mill rates that actually does the taxation to foster some supports in regards to this. There's also the appeal process, and the, while it wasn't used and they didn't take advantage of that opportunity in 2017, we do still have uh, uh, an extension to enable them to foster that appeal. But the municipality has tools available to them to mitigate some of these costs. They have the ability to target some of these respective nations, and they are the ones taxing. So, Unfortunately, Schreiber is, in fact, taxed at a higher rate than some of the other municipalities, and we recognize and do feel for this family who are obviously in a, case, in a situation where their assessments have gone up because of valuations, and as a consequence, their taxes are going up. We have ways to mitigate that, and we should thank foster you, and support you. them in that regard. I recognize the member from Etobicoke North. Thank you very much. My question is for the Minister of International Trade. About NAFTA. Minister, as you will know, in the United States of today, given the random acts of policy making there, there is a lot of uncertainty around the North American Free Trade Agreement. A particular concern is how Ontario's economy will be materially affected by these cross-border trade negotiations. I've met, for example, with stakeholders in my own riding of Etobicoke North who are wondering what the effect will be on their businesses, their workers, and their families. Ontario understands the key importance of free trade relationships with the United States of America in particular. NAFTA, unfortunately, will also, with the uncertainty, potentially negatively affect 
areas such as Windsor and Hamilton, and indeed many, many different areas across the province. And therefore, it's particularly important for Ontario to be actively Question. engaged so that our interests can be representative, preserved, and they will prosper. So my question is this. Can the minister please tell me what steps we as a government are taking to ensure that we will be standing up for Ontario's workers and businesses during these Thank negotiations? You. The President of Treasury Board. Oh, no, Minister of International Trade. Well, thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank the Honourable Member from Etobicoke North for asking. Uh, Madam Speaker, we all know that NAFTA is very important to Ontario, to Ontarians, and to Ontario jobs. Speaker, I know that people in this province are feeling uncertain as negotiations continue, and our government, Speaker, this government is prepared for all outcomes. Our government is being proactive. The Premier, as you know, have met over 30 U.S. governors, and I myself have met with many U.S. legislators, senators, and other officials. In these meetings, Sir? we discuss our trade interdependence, which supports millions of jobs across North America and mutually strengthens our trade and investment. Additionally, myself, along with Mr. Neil and Del Duca, thank you. Thank you. I will turn the back to the member for North. in Montreal. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the uh, Minister of International uh, Trade uh, for his uh, dedication and also his crisscrossing the globe in Ontario's interest. I appreciate, uh, Minister, as you've just outlined, that our government takes the concerns over NAFTA very, very seriously. We know, for example, that Ontario is the economic driver of Canada, and we must stand by our businesses and workers and their families who have always been a pillar of our province's growth and prosperity. In particular, a shining light in the Ontario economic sector is the auto sector. Here in Ontario, for example, the auto sector directly employs over 100,000 people and indirectly employs hundreds of thousands more. Minister, you, along with colleagues of our government, were recently in NAFTA negotiations in Montreal, and I, re I realize that you are a strong representative of Ontario's auto sector. So I'd ask you, would you please elaborate for this chamber more about the negotiations concerning this important facet of Ontario's economy? Your Minister of International Trade. Uh, to Minister responsible for economic development and growth. To economic development and growth. Thank the member from Etobicoke North for his question, and I thank my colleague, the Minister of International Trade, for the extraordinary work that he's doing on behalf of our province and our province's economy. Speaker. So the member from Etobicoke North is correct. While I and the Minister of International Trade and the Minister of Agriculture were at the NAFTA negotiations in Montreal, there was a large portion of the discussion that took place relating to Ontario's auto sector. We know that the auto sector in North America succeeds when all states and provinces and all three NAFTA countries work together. And it's crucially important to not forget that we are important to the U.S. auto sector as well. And we made sure that this message was not forgotten. For example, Speaker, our automotive supply chain is extremely integrated with Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and many other U.S. states. On average, a vehicle will cross the U.S.-Ontario border seven times before it finally rolls off the production line, and nine million U.S. jobs are supported by trade between the U.S. and Ontario and, of course, the rest of Canada. Our government will always stand up for the auto industry, and we have shown this commitment time and time, time, and time again. again. When the auto sector needed our help during the recession, not everyone in this place, Speaker, chose to support them, but our Sir, government certainly did. We will continue to fight for our businesses. We will continue to fight for our workers, uh, Speaker, because this government is on the side of all Ontarians. And I look forward to having the opportunity over the next number of days with yeah. colleagues Thank to, con you. to Thank continue you. to stand up for Ontario. I recognize the member from Simple Thank you. Uh, my question is to the Attorney General. Speaker, this year the Ontario Association of Landscape Architects celebrates its 50th anniversary. And I'm delighted to see a strong showing from Ontario's 1,700 landscape architects in the legislature today. I know they've been working over the last few years to build a case for the same regulatory status as architects and other professionals. And I understand that the Attorney General has advised the profession to work within their current Title Act rather than offer the public stronger protection with a Practice Act. I further understand that there is significant public harm that could be done if action isn't taken in this regard. So I ask. Will the minister take a second look at this important public safety issue, or could he at least advise this House what analysis his ministry did to really show the profession 
that the ministry took the request seriously. Minister, Attorney General. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite uh, for, for this question. And I would first like to say that we greatly value the contributions uh, the landscape architects make in our province. Landscape architects use specialized technical related training for grading, stormwater control, erosion control, and other matters to help reduce physical safety risk in public spaces. Their work, Speaker, is vital to building Ontario up. I would also like to offer my own personal congratulations, as well as congratulations on behalf of our government and Premier to Ontario Association of Landscape Architects for celebrating their 50th anniversary this year. This is a truly remarkable uh, landmark speaker. I was, speak, uh, I was pl uh, pleased to speak at the OALA AGM speaker last year in Ottawa and look forward to continuing building our relationship together. I would also especially like to thank Ms. Anna Budrovic, Executive Director of OALA, who is here with us today for her continued hard work on the advancement of the profession, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, I believe that OLA has, has met with other title uh, protection professions uh, as well to, and have had productive conversations about the continued thank development. Thank you. And I, I return adding, back adding to the member from Simcoe Gray. Well, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Attorney General. Certainly, uh, we understand, Minister, as you said, you, you advised the uh, landscape architects to meet with the chartered professional accountants to show how landscape architects could make their current act achieve the same objectives. With issues like street safety, flooding and climate change impacted by this matter, would now not be the time to take another look at the issue. That's what I'm asking on behalf of the association. Is the minister not aware that the profession is growing at twice the speed of traditional architecture and needs the government's support for a practice act? And so, Minister, will you revisit this issue? Attorney General. Uh, Speaker, I, I, I want to thank the work that, uh, that uh, OALA uh, does and the very productive conversations that, uh, that my ministry uh, staff uh, and my office staff had with the association. Uh, Speaker, uh, as the member opposite said, the association did submit materials for us to support their case when it comes to full practice protection. The documents, in our view, did not provide systemic evidence that restricting the practice of landscape architect architecture to members of the Ontario Association of Landscape Architects was necessary to protect the public from harm. Protecting the public uh, from harm is a key factor when extending a government-sanctioned professional monopoly because this type of legislation would impact the ability of some people in Ontario to make a living. Speaker, as for next steps, my ministry plans to work with OALA, uh, OALA on reviewing their current act and assessing areas for revision and further professionalization of the work of landscape architecture. In particular, Speaker, we hope to work together on the association's bylaw making powers and enhancing Sir? their existing disciplinary process. I look forward to continue working with them and further exploring this issue. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the member for Windsor to come say. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Good morning. Speaker, one would think when you have a facility that attracts 15,000 tourists a year, this government would do everything in its power to save it and keep it open for visitors. A case in point is the Canadian Club Brand Heritage Centre in the old Walkerville neighbourhood of Windsor. It was built in 1894. It has a, it's a magnificent structure modelled after palaces in, in uh, Italy. It has a colourful history of prohibition, gangsters, gunshots and great Canadian whisky. Why does this Liberal government continue to wash its hands of helping with the solution so the doors of this superb facility can reopen to the public? Minister of Culture, Tourism and Sports. Minister of Finance. Sir, Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, uh, I appreciate the member opposite and his advocacy in regards to this very issue. As noted, uh, Beam Suntory is the one that ultimately now owns uh, uh, the operations of Canadian Club brand, and Harm Walker is uh, producing it in a separate facility, selling some of their brand through that retail operation. And the member opposite recognizes the need and the desire for the community to have its heritage at the initial site so as to be able to sell and attract tourism. Uh, of course, uh, the new owners have since closed it down and have opted not to proceed. They are now trying to work alongside the municipality and this member who has been trying 
uh, hard to find a way to do this without setting a precedent that co is contrary in respect to retailing of beverage alcohol outside the normal operations. I'll, I'll respond more. Thank the, you. The I recognize the member from Windsor to come say. Speaker, any micro distiller in Ontario can sell its product on site. Canadian Club whiskey has been made in this distillery for more than 100 years. Why can't the Liberals cut the red tape, modernize Ontario's regulations, and allow Canadian Club whiskey to be sold where it's made in Walkerville, Ontario, and bring back those 15,000 tourists who want to see the facility each year and maybe, just maybe, buy a bottle of Canadian Club on their way out the door? Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Um, yeah, so I understand the member opposite's concern, and we recognize that there is the ability to retail some of these uh, products at, at those microbreweries and some of the other sites where they produce them. Problem is, it's not being produced in the specific site that's being requested. So we're trying to foster a way. Uh, how do, can we engage in that ability? Uh, without contravening the very issues that we put in place to protect the distillers and, and the industry in terms of retailing these operations. But there's more here, and that's about tourism, and that's about the cultural aspect and the historical significance of this site. And I, and I agree with this member. We've got to find a way to make this work. Thank you. Recognize the member from London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh... <laughs> Minister of Transportation. Speaker, for almost 15 years, I've been very proud to represent a riding in southwestern Ontario. My city of London is the economic hub of this extraordinary region, with Western University, Fanshawe College, financial institutions, a robust manufacturing sector, a growing high-tech industry, and a booming agri-food sector. Speaker, we need to make sure that we are keeping up. That's why I am so proud to unequivocally stand in support of high-speed rail uh, to London, Speaker, and beyond. Minister, would you please provide the members of this house, house with an update on what we're doing on high-speed rail? Yeah. So transportation. Yeah, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for London North Centre for her question and all of her hard work on behalf of our region. Speaker, we've been actively moving forward on high-speed rail. Since announcing the initial $15 million for a comprehensive environmental assessment back in May 2016, our government has issued a request for bids for the EA Terms of Reference for the new portion of the corridor that's between Kitchener and London, and we have announced our plan to create a high-speed rail planning advisory board. Just last week, I announced that David Collinette, our former special advisor for HSR, will lead the board. Mr. Collinette brings the experience that we need for the next phase of this project, and together with Mr. Collinette's team, we'll continue to move forward on bringing high-speed rail to communities Sir? across southwestern Ontario. But the PCs, with billions and billions of dollars of undisclosed cuts in their uh, platform, we know that high-speed rail would be off the table. And Okay. I recognize the member from Ajax Pickering. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I, I really wish to welcome to Queen's Park this morning a very special nurse from Ajax, Cephaline Bionarn. Cephaline is today is here as part of the 18th Annual Registered Nurses Association of Ontario Annual Queen's Park Day. And also at the same time, I want to welcome this morning the Executive Director of Safe Home in Durham Region, Larry Shanks, who is here today to take part in the Queen's Park Human Trafficking Awareness Day in Room 247. Thank you. I recognize the member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Thank you very much. Speaker, it's my pleasure this morning to again welcome to Queen's Park uh, two wonderful nurses from the great riding of Chatham, Ken Essex. I'd like to uh, introduce Anita Purdy and Betty Oldershaw. We're doing a fabulous job on behalf of the RNAO back in my riding. Member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. I know I introduced a list of nurses, and I forgot the most important one, the one from Sudbury. Oh. So, David Grew, Paul Andre Gauthier, Maria Cassa, and Deborah Anderson. Sorry, I forgot you guys. Um, I recognize the member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I would also like to recognize the wonderful nurses that are here from Hamilton uh, representing RNAO. Today we have Irene Molinar, Nilu Begon Beganian, and Bahar Karimi. Thank you so much for joining us at Queen's Park today. Thank you. 
The member from London, uh, West. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I would like to welcome uh, Akua Frempong and uh, Brenda Hutton, two wonderful nurses from London, who I had the privilege of meeting this morning for breakfast as part of RNAO on the road. Thank you. The member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. I too would like to welcome some guests from Queen's Park for my riding of Beaches East York. Doris Grinspoon is a constituent, and we we'll welcome all the nurses. And I know there are six nurses from Beaches East York who I couldn't meet with this morning because I had a conflict, but I welcome them here as well. Thank you. Okay. To come, Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I had meetings this morning. I didn't make it to the nurses' breakfast. Just in case there's anyone here from Windsor and Essex County, welcome to Queen's Park. Seeing there's no deferred vote, the House will be recessed until 1 p.m. Yeah.